Aloha Kako. Hello everyone. Welcome to Live from Norlab at Gemini. I'm your host, Alyssa Leilani Grace. Today's guest is Dr. Trent Dupuy, and our moderator is Jamika Marshall. We are all employees of NSF's Norlab and work from Hilo, Hawaii with the International Gemini Observatory. Before we get started, please remember that if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the YouTube chat and Jamika will read them aloud. Now let's fully introduce our special guest, Trent Dupuy. Trent came to Gemini North in Hilo, Hawaii in August 2017. He moved from the University of Texas at Austin, where he was a postdoctoral research fellow. Prior to that, he was a Hubble fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He studied at the University of Hawaii at Manoa for his PhD thesis, where he used the telescopes on Mauna Kea for his research on the coldest stars and brown dwarfs. His work focuses on high precision measurements of these cold objects at infrared wavelengths, often using the technique of adaptive optics with a laser guide star. At Gemini, he has worked on our infrared instrumentation and a variety of adaptive optics related projects like GNAO and the planned upgrade of Gemini's planet imager, GPI. Thanks for being with us today, Trent. Now to start the show, let's talk more about the International Gemini Observatory. Gemini International Observatory is a program of NSF's NORLAB. Gemini Observatory, like the Constellation, is a twin telescope with one telescope located on Cerro Pichon in Chile and the other located near the summit of Mauna Kea on Hawaii Island. These locations in both the northern and southern hemisphere allow us to observe the night sky surrounding our entire planet. Our international participants include the United States, Canada, Chile, Brazil, Argentina, and Korea. Now, most people are familiar with the basic and often largest parts of a telescope, i.e. the mirrors, which are circled in the left picture here. But today I wanna to talk briefly about telescope instruments, which are circled in the right picture. Telescope instruments are not musical instruments. They are devices placed on and around telescopes that help to filter out the starlight that is collected by the mirrors. So telescope instruments act as filters for picking out specific kinds of light from specific objects. Let's look at GPI, the Gemini Planet Imager. GPI is specifically designed to search for planets and brown dwarfs around other stars using a mask known as a coronagraph to partially block a star's light. Together with adaptive optics correcting for turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere and advanced image processing, researchers can search a star's neighborhood for Jupiter-like exoplanets and brown dwarfs up to a million times fainter than the host star. Unlike other exoplanet detection systems, which use indirect methods to infer the location of exoplanets, GPI detects planets by directly imaging them alongside their parent stars. Pictured here on the left is the instrument, GPI, and on the right is sort of an inside look at the different processes of GPI, starting with the light coming in from the telescope and then going to different parts of the instrument. And now for our Gemini science highlight. Today we're looking at one of Trent's favorite press releases, The Formative Years, Giant Planets versus Brown Dwarfs. This PR from June 2019 discusses some of the surprising results from the first 300 stars of the five-year GPIs survey, which at its completion had observed 531 stars. Now, you may be wondering, what are brown dwarf stars? Brown dwarfs are objects more massive than planets, but not massive enough to fuse hydrogen like stars. 
So a long-standing question in the astronomy community is, are brown dwarfs born like stars or planets? Based on some of the patterns observed via this survey, it seems most likely that brown dwarfs are born like stars via core collapse of a gas cloud versus planets which form from the accretion of leftover star materials. Now this press release has a lot of other really cool findings, so I highly recommend that everyone go and check that out. Now without any further ado, let's hear from our guest, Dr. Trent Dupuis. Thank you, Alyssa, for the nice introduction. Um, today, so I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the GPI results that uh, Alyssa was mentioning toward the end um, as part of uh, what I'm calling our stellar census. So uh, how have we learned what uh, objects live in our solar neighborhood, whether they're on their own like stars or if they're orbiting uh, stars like planets. Um, so the, the, uh, the uh, little intro here is that, you know, we're, we're undergoing a census in the United States right now. Um, uh, here in Hawaii, it's uh, the, some of the field work is just wrapping up. And when you go into uh, fill out your census response to tell the government, you know, where you, the main thing they want to know is where you live. That's the first thing that you have to, um, I have to tell them that's that's what determines uh, what states get how many representatives in Congress and funding and all these things is your address. Um, and so for astronomy, we have something similar. We have so sorry. So the so the way you know that you break down these things on Earth, or you have these two dimensional maps. You're very familiar with them. You use them every day now with the way of smartphones. This is an old map of Hilo, just showing how different parts of town can be broken. Down. First, you have you know the whole town is one zip code, and then you can break that down into even smaller pieces. Um, and we do the same sort of thing with uh, astronomy. Uh, if you've ever looked, seen a star, a map of the stars before, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, we have uh, in these maps, and then we have constellations that are. A lot of times, we think of constellations as what on this diagram are the green lines. So take. Cygnus the swan, for example. Um, when you think of Cygnus, if you're uh, uh, an, uh, any sort of interest, have any sort of interest in astronomy, you think of maybe this is the wings of the swan, and then here's the body of the swan. But um, and, and that's that's the where the idea of this constellation came from. But this is actually just a, a, the, the asterism of Cygnus. The constellation, technically, for what what astronomers mean by constellation, is the yellow border around uh, Cygnus. So any star that falls within this yellow border belongs to this constellation. So they're kind of like zip codes for the stars. So uh, we have a similar system um, on the sky as we do on the earth. It's just looking up instead of looking down. Um, and this is just the two dimensional map of the sky. Uh, th to get into a little more detail and, and this will be relevant, It's Latitude and longitude is not necessarily the most uh, exciting topic, but as we as you probably learned at some point in school, um, on Earth on the, the maps on Earth you divide. Uh, this is showing you um, a bit of the United States. So you got New Jersey here and Delaware, and these big these thick blue lines are uh, one degree in in um, uh, longitude, which is these vertical lines, and latitude, which are the horizontal lines, and then you can further subdivide that subdivide that grid down into smaller pieces. Um, and the just like uh, on, on Earth, we use the same sort of terminology on the sky. You divide a degree into 60 minutes, uh, then there's 360 degrees around, of course. Um, then you degree divide every minute down into 60 seconds. And so one second of longitude or latitude on the Earth corresponds to about 30 meters or 100 feet, uh, just to give you some sense of scale. So a second is pretty small in terms of the sense of this whole scale of the globe. Um, so, on and of course in space, you know we have these two D maps of of the sky, like I showed. But really, uh, what we want to know is where the stars live in this three dimensional universe that we live in um, in this galaxy. So this is what I'm this this um, 
picture is showing is just the very nearest stars. So this is a, um, a graphic pulled from a, a little bit old uh, National Geographic, but a very nice National Geographic poster that actually shows, uh, zooms into the scale of the solar system and all the way out to the scale of the, the local group of galaxies. This is just a piece of it showing some of the stars in our immediate neighborhood. Um, and it's only going out to about 20 light years. Um, so these are, you know, this is really everything that's within 20 light years of us. Um, if you started zooming out further, you would, all the stars would start to blur together a, a lot more. Um, but so if, if you want to actually know where stars are, and that's what we need to do in astronomy usually is we need to know actually where they are, not just where, where you can point your telescope at them, uh, but where physically they are in the universe, then you need this three-dimensional information. Um, so how do we do that? The, the way that we do it is through the parallax effect. So uh, the, the idea of parallax is simply that you take, you, you're able to observe something from two different vantage points. So in this diagram, it's viewpoint A and viewpoint B. And when you look at something nearby um, with respect to something far away, then that nearby object will look, will appear to move with respect to these distant backgrounds. So in this case, you know, this, this object, when you look at it from the B point, it looks like it's in front of uh, the red square. If you look at it from the A point, it looks like it's from, in front of the blue square. So um, this is something that uh, actually you can do very easily uh, at home or wherever you're at. Uh, the, the simplest way to show this is to use your, each of your eyes as the two vantage points and hold out your thumb to some distance and look for something in your background and close each of your eyes. And you should be able to see if you pick something, you should be able to move your thumb from one thing to another thing in the background, um, just by closing your left eye and closing your right eye. And so that's, that's it, that's the parallax effect. Um, the way that astronomers use this to measure star distances is the, we use the fact that the Earth is constantly moving around the sun. So here, here in June, the Earth will be, you know, let's just say here on this diagram, um, but we're orbiting, right? We go around the sun uh, every uh, year. Uh, the distance to the sun is 93 million miles. So that's a really long uh, distance. So if we wait until for six months when the Earth is all the way on the other side of our orbit, it's moved millions and millions of miles. So that gives us uh, a much, it basically allows us to move our eyeballs way farther apart so we can see distant uh, stars. Uh, e even distant stars will appear to move with respect to really, really far away stars. Um, so, so, and there's actually been a recent um, news story that you, someone may have, some of you may have seen about uh, the New Horizons probe that went to Pluto that probe is now so far away from Earth because it's gone past Pluto that it can measure, it can see the parallax effect just from taking images of the stars. The stars from where the New Horizons probe is look different from the stars on Earth and that's just the parallax effect. Um, so uh, just to illustrate it one more way with a, a little uh, gif here is that uh, the other way of thinking about this is that as you move back and forth, um, nearby things move a lot more than background things. So this is illustrating how it is. So, so how it is we measure distance. Basically, we see how much something moves and that directly tells us how far away it is um, because yeah, we can relate uh, the angle. So, so basically the bigger the parallax motion, the, mo the closer the star is, and then that's what allows us to measure distances. Um, so how much do stars move? So if you go back to this uh, diagram of the stars in our solar neighborhood, how much do some of these things actually move on the sky? Um, the closest star system to us is the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, and it moves over the course of six months, it moves about one and a half seconds. So if you think back to the long latitude and longitude thing, um, if you were thinking about that, that, that in terms of earth uh, on the scale of the earth, one, sec one and a half seconds on the earth is about 50 meters or 150 feet. Uh, 160 feet. 
Um, so that's actually quite substantial. I mean, if you were on the earth, that might actually change your address from one place to the other, but that's really exceptional. That's just, that's Alpha Centauri, the very closest stars. Nothing else moves nearly as much as Alpha Centauri. If you go a little bit farther away, say to um, the Sirius system, uh, which is about twice as far away as Alpha Centauri is from us, uh, you know, it moves uh, half as much as Alpha Centauri. So this is a, just a simple linear relationship between how much stars move versus how distant they are. Uh, and then finally, if you go just a, another factor of two roughly in distance, you start running into objects that have very different names. Uh, Alpha Centauri and Sirius, of course, are known from ancient times. Sirius is known as the dog star. Um, it was very important to ancient Egyptians. It's the brightest star in the entire sky. Um, and just a little bit farther from it is something that we call wise PAJ 1541, 51.66 minus 22, 50, 25.2, which obviously is something that is not known to the ancients. And I'll get into a little bit about where those come from next. I have a question for you, Trent. Um, so the distances you're talking about here and the amount that stars are moving, this is in respect to our own motion, right? Like that's how much the star appears to be moving. That's right. So that's why I put move in quotes. Sorry. So they're, the stars are staying, well, the stars are moving, all the stars are orbiting the galaxy, the center of the galaxy. But we're all kind of doing that together. So there's a little bit of, um, it's sort of like you imagine walking through an airport or something, everybody's kind of moving, you're moving with respect to other people. Um, but, okay, that's not a good an analogy, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> but basically, the, the, stars are, the stars are orbiting the galaxy, but that happens very slowly. So we orbit the galaxy once every um, 250,000 years. No, 250 million years, sorry. So very long time. Um, and so what we're talking about is one year, you know, these things are from our vantage point, they're appearing to move, but of course they're not actually moving in this, in space. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Jamika, did you have a, something from the chat? Yes, Trent. So question here. So, um, You've already told us about the size of brown dwarfs between um, the size of a Jupiter-sized planet or a small star. What kind of radiation do brown dwarfs emit? They, they emit the same way, the same type of radiation as stars in the sense that it's essentially the same type of radiation as a incandescent light bulb, which I know are getting less and less common nowadays. Um, but if you're familiar with light bulbs that have a little filament in them that you, when you apply more electricity to it, it uh, heats up and gets hotter and gets brighter. That's the same radiation behind both stars and brown dwarfs. It's just that brown dwarfs are basically have less electricity, you know, less power given to them. And so they have, they emit, um, less light and the, the light is redder than, the stars like the sun, which is, they, they approach more yellowish, whitish light. Okay, is that it? Okay, cool. So uh, how did we get from, how do we get, how do we have stuff in our immediate solar neighborhood that are both known to the ancients and uh, discovered very recently? This thing, by the way, I was gonna um, say that, you know, we didn't know about this wise PHA 1541 object being in our solar neighborhood until after uh, like the, my oldest niece was born. So when she was born, we didn't know this thing was in our solar neighborhood. So how did, how did we get here? So if we go back <laughs> to one of the first um, recorded cases of, of someone thinking about parallax, you have Aristotle who, uh, a Greek philosopher, he studied many different things, biology, but he also thought about astronomy. Uh, 2,400 years ago, he was aware of an er even earlier Greek theory of possibly the, the universe being centered on the sun um, because, you know, I mean, it's very bright and all this stuff. So, but he dismissed it because he knew that if the earth orbited the sun, you would see this parallax effect that I just described. 
And so he, tr you know, he tried to observe it and he didn't see it because it is, it's basically, you can't observe it with the naked eye. Um, but because of this, you know, at that time he had dismissed this idea, um, but it had always, this idea had, has been around for thousands of years that, that the earth might orbit the sun. Um, <clears throat> it got, uh, this idea of the earth orbiting sun got more uh, credibility when Nicholas Copernicus does, uh, figured out that um, if the earth orbits the sun, that would explain a lot of things about the motions of particularly the planets. Um, you see retrograde motion of, of planets like Mars where the Mars will go this way in the sky and then back and then this way, which is very, it seemed seemingly unnatural, but you can explain that if, if earth is orbiting interior to Mars and they're both orbiting the sun. Um, so uh, the problem of course, and Copernicus knew about this is that, you know, no one has seen stellar parallax even up to this time, time in the in the um, 15th century, so uh, it must just mean that the Earth's orbit is really big and the stars are very far away. Or sorry, the Earth's orbit is small relative to the distance of the stars. Um, so even just immediately after, like pretty soon after Copernicus proposed this theory, Tycho Brahe, which is like uh, one of the most famous astronomers of his time, one of the most well respected, um, he he couldn't measure parallax either. Um, he actually, there's a, and I won't go into too much detail, but he actually used the combination of his inability to measure the parallax. And he did claim that he could see, um, could resolve how big stars were. So he thought he had measured the size of stars in the same way that uh, astronomers at this time could see the extent of some of the planets in our solar system. Um, he thought he could see that. Uh, and so he did some math to show basically that Copernicus model is ridiculous. If, if you can measure star sizes and you can't measure parallax, then yeah, Coper Copernicus's model wouldn't work. But pretty much immediately, Galileo uh, showed that Tycho just incorrectly measured star sizes. Like, you know, basically Tycho's measurements were just totally bogus. Um, and Galileo proved that stars are at least 60 times smaller than Tycho claimed. And so if the stars are really tiny, then this whole problem goes away and you can have Copernicus's model. And so this is fine. So then we're still in the you know, uh, 16th, 17th century here, but it wouldn't be almost like another 200 years before um, the parallax would actually be measured. Uh, and that's just, it required advances in technology and basically in te telescope technology. Um, once that was, once a certain level of telescope technology was attained, then you had three different astronomers within a few months all measure parallaxes of different nearby stars. So you had Henderson measuring Alpha Centauri, which is the closest one, which should be the easiest. Um, interestingly, not that it wasn't just Alpha Centauri that people were looking at. You had um, Bessel looking at 61 Cygni and Struve looking at Vega. 61 Cygni in particular, one of the reasons I think that Bessel observed it is because it's very far to the north. So it stays, um, it's observable from the Northern hemisphere for much of the year. Uh, so you can just, you can get lots and lots of data on it, whereas many other stars, they go away with the seasons, but things that are closer to the um, North Pole, you can observe um, very easily from, from Europe. Um, so yeah, so once this happened, this kind of exploded. And so that's, so then it became commonplace um, by the time we're in the early 20th century, we had mapped out parallaxes for basically all the bright stars in our neighborhood. Um, so what's surprising then is going back to this idea of having these um, modern discoveries with these uh, bulky numerical names like WISE 0855 or 1049. Um, they were discovered very recently and discovered to be among the nearest systems to the sun. So they bumped off uh, the previous fourth and fifth place record holders, uh, I think it's actually, or maybe it's third and fourth place record holders in terms of the nearest stars to the sun. So what is happening here? How did, how did these things go missing for so long? Um, well, it, we have to think about what are stars, and this kind of goes back to what um, Alyssa was telling us at the beginning about the difference between stars and brown dwarfs. So what this, figure is showing you, this is what we call a hersprung russell diagram. Um, on stars that are brighter are um, closer to the top of the plot, stars that are fainter are down here, um, and then stars that are hot are on the left side, 
and stars that are cold are on the right side. So mostly stars follow this. If you're bright, uh, sorry, if you're hot, you're bright. And if you're cold, you're faint, which kind of makes sense. There are some unusual objects here, white dwarfs, which I'm not gonna talk about. White dwarfs are hot, but faint. That's because they're very, very tiny, dead stars, basically. Um, but that are basically the, the core of, of dead stars. But when you, you see, you know, stars like Sirius are hot and bright and easy to see. Um, as you go colder and colder and fainter, um, uh, you get to the point where, as um, we were talking about, the light from these brown dwarfs, light from the very low mass stars, then if you go into the brown dwarfs, is so dim that they just were, that you're not able to see them even with um, telescopes very easily. Uh, with, with, teles with old technology telescopes, you basically need infrared technology to be able to see the light that's coming from them because they're so red that they don't emit light at the wavelengths that we see. And so, and ex um, so the reason behind this, of course, is nuclear fusion. So nuclear fusion uh, is what powers the sun. It, the sun is massive enough that its core gets up to millions of degrees, uh, you, the sort of temperatures you need to spark nuclear fusion. Um, but that's all thanks to the mass bearing down on the core and creating this intense pressure and temperature. If you have less mass to push down, um, then you have, uh, you end up with a scenario where the core temperature can drop below a critical temperature that's necessary for fusion. So that temperature is about 5 million degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so uh, few, once you get below that critical temperature, you cannot create your own energy. And so you get really faint given enough time. And that's what brown dwarfs are. Um, Alyssa, do you have a question from the chat? I have a question, not from the chat, just oh. <laughs> uh, for some of our viewers who, who might not feel comfortable asking this, but are you saying that stars are not just balls of fire? They don't burn like fire, that's right. So there's no, um, that's why I'm trying, I try to be careful uh, even among astronomers, sometimes you hear people talk about nuclear burning, but that's not uh, accurate. It's, so you're, you're taking hydrogen and fusing it into helium and that releases energy. Um, so it's more like an H-bomb. Now, if you're, to our, for us, maybe it, it's not a huge difference between a really big fire and an H-bomb, but it is a fundamentally different process. So, um, that's, that's where the energy is coming from. Oh, jamika has got something. Hi Trent, just a comment here um, from the YouTube live audience. We have Dale and Harriet Dupuy, of course, sending a big aloha out to Dr. Dupuy. And also you have your nieces here with us today, Lucy and Olivia saying aloha. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, hello, aloha back. So, um, uh, hi, Lucy and Olivia. Um, great, so, okay, so brown dwarf. So because of this, they don't have their own sustained energy source. So they really just, it's like taking, you know, the, uh, one astronomer has likened it to taking an ember, a hot ember out of a fire, a campfire, right? At first it's glowing orange, but if you watch it long enough, it starts to just fade and become gray. And that's kind of what happens with brown dwarfs. They just get colder and colder with time. Um, and of course, there's been plenty of time in the universe, billions of years, our galaxy is billions of years old. So we, our galaxy is full of these cold brown dwarfs. Um, and just to illustrate this with a maybe more familiar example, you know, you see in, especially in like spy movies or whatever, uh, at nighttime, you're trying to see what the human, you know, the spy might be trying to see what the humans are doing in the dark, but, and so they don't put on, like, they don't use just a big telescope or binoculars, they use infrared vision, they use infrared detectors to see the heat signature of humans, and all that's, those heat sensors are doing is just looking at a different wavelength of light compared to what our eyes can see. So all the, to see something that's really faint, like human beings that are, you know, we're emitting light, um, 
but you don't just build a really big telescope that looks at the same wavelengths that our eyes can see. You actually use different technology to see it. Jimmy Kim. Yes, Trent. So from our YouTube audience, we have a question. A question here is, are brown dwarfs classified as a type of star or is it a class on its own? That's a very good question. I think the simple answer is that we would call it a class on its own. The, uh, all, it depends on the, in general, we, we, we have gotten into this habit of saying that, yes, these are physically different objects. You have stars powered by fusion and you have brown dwarfs powered by nothing um, except their own, the heat of their formation. And so in that sense, they're a different class of object. Um, but then in some other contexts, let's just say if you're looking at newborn stars and brown dwarfs, newborn stars are not vastly different from brown dwarfs in the sense that they're all powered from their initial heat kind of at that point. Um, what you call pre-main, so there's a terminology in astronomy called pre-main sequence stars that it's talking about, and we observe many of these stars that like that have yet to begin their stable hydrogen fusion on the main sequence that they will live on for billions of years. So in stellar nurseries, a lot of times we don't distinguish so much between the two classes because it's not important as it's not as important. Um, so, so uh, that's the more nuanced answer, but in general, yes, we basically call brown dwarfs substellar, meaning below stars, whereas, and so then they're not technically stars by that logic. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, it does. Um, and in your definition, there's the phrase uh, main sequence stars. Um, can you uh, tell us what main sequence stars are? Main sequence. So what that means is that when a star like the sun uh, achieves, it's a, it's the balance between, um, I'll just go back a couple. So for stars like the sun, you have the force of gravity pushing down of all this mass. And then from the inside of the star, you have the force of the radiation basically that's fighting against it. It's, it's heating up the gas that allows it to beat that, it basically has um, gas pressure, is pushing out. So you have gas pressure, um, and the hotter the gas is, the higher the pressure is. You have that gas pressure pushing out, and you have the gravity pushing down. And so once a star gets into a balance, it stays there for a very long time. And so the sun is in that balance right now. So the sun achieved that balance four and a half billion years ago. It'll stay in balance for another five billion years. Um, it, it changes slightly with time as it uses up the um, hydrogen in the core. Um, the sun will change size a little bit um, and brightness, but it will fundamentally stay in that same state for a billion years. And so that's what I mean by main sequence. It's stars that are currently in that balanced state and they're not either, yeah, they're not like dying or being born or anything like that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Trent. Sure. So, brown dwarfs. As I was saying, you know, if you want to see people in the dark, you need infrared cameras. You don't just use a really big binocular or something like that. You just get an infrared detector. And so that's, um, that's part of where the name for brown dwarfs came from, is that they weren't going to be stars that emitted light that we would see with our eyes. And so um, the term was actually coined by Jill Tarter, who, um, the reason I have this picture from the movie Contact, down here with Jodie Foster is that the Jodie Foster character in Contact was based on um, Jill Tarter. And so uh, she was trying to come up with a, a color for these things that would be something off of the visible spectrum. So that's why she came up with Brown Dwarf. Um, she, the whole reason she was studying them back in the seventies was because uh, she thought they might be the explanation for dark matter, uh, which I'm not gonna get into dark matter unless someone asks. Basically, we know that the galaxy is full of something that's gravitationally active, but doesn't emit light. Um, and uh, as like I said, brown dwarfs, if they're not emitting visible light, maybe we've just missed them this whole time. It turns out that there's not nearly enough brown dwarfs in the galaxy to explain 
dark matter, but that was a, a theory back in the 70s. Um, so the technology that we use to find them is essentially just infrared cameras. And, you know, it's the sort of thing that used to be um, only, you know, governments and militaries had access to it. Now, you know, it's become more mainstream. Infrared camera technology is widespread. And so it's the sort of thing that has been uh, adapted by the astronomical community for the last couple of decades. Um, just to show another example of an actual astronomical image that's infrared, here's one of our beautiful Gemini images of a very recognizable object. This is Saturn. Um, and then in the foreground, you here have the moon Titan. Uh, and so this is just to show that, you know, when you look at planets, um, the planets are kind of like brown dwarfs in the sense that if you look at a visible light image of Saturn, all you're seeing is reflected light off of the clouds of Saturn. You're not actually seeing Saturn emit any light on its own. But here you can see Saturn is glowing in between the clouds. Um, and then the rings have a different, uh, temperature and so they glow at a different in a different way. So uh, you can so th this just shows that these things are emitting light uh, at these infrared wavelengths, even things as cold as Saturn were much colder than the objects that I'm talking about today. Um, so the first time that the entire sky was mapped in the infrared uh, was the uh, two, mi two micron all sky survey. Um, it was done in the late 90s or so. And um, this is an image of the, you know, putting the galactic plane along this axis so you can see many more stars. There still is uh, very thick dust as you look toward the center of the galaxy. So you, even in the infrared, you can't see through some of this dust. But looking in the infrared allows you to see through a lot more dust than, um, than visible light. That's another advantage of the infrared. Um, so this was, uh, you know, 20 plus years ago. Um, more recently has been a space survey, um, the NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE, which is where some of those names I was mentioning earlier came from. Um, WISE was this uh, cryogenically cooled space uh, uh, mission that mapped the entire sky at much colder, oh, sorry, much at even longer wavelengths, basically allowing you to see even colder objects. So that's the, the trend here is, to see colder things, you have to keep going longer and longer wavelengths. So, um, so even deeper into the infrared. And this is where our, some of these very recent objects came from that I'm talking about that just we discovered in the solar neighborhood. So um, one of them is this object wise 1049, which is also known as Lumen 16. It's a pair of brown dwarfs that are now the third closest system to us, um, something I'll just mention briefly because uh, it's kind of fun. We used to, you can, you can uh, as I mentioned, as Alyssa asked about earlier, she's asking, are the stars actually moving? Yes, we're all orbiting the galaxy. And so stars are moving relative to, to each other, but it's over, you know, usually millions of years that you would see any difference in um, like what the closest star system is to us. So we knew if by rewinding and and fast forwarding the motions of stars that we saw that some of the stars in our solar neighborhood used to be closer to us than, than they are today. So in the past, you had some other, some of the stars in that, the image I showed you that were um, closer than Alpha Centauri is, for example. But by far the closest ever <laughs> known object is something we didn't know about until just a few years ago. It's this object called WISE 0720, uh, otherwise known as Schultz's star. <coughs> Excuse me, and it actually passed within, we think, within the Oort cloud, the cloud of comets that surrounds the solar system. So it kind of entered our solar system for a brief time. And some measurements that um, we did from Mauna Kea with the Canada Francois telescope uh, and with Keck uh, allowed us to get a really precise handle on where, when and where it actually passed. Um, and so, uh, and it, what's amusing about this for me is that it's, if you, if you saw, if you just uh, saw it with a telescope, you would see just a, um, uh, from the ground, you would just see a, a red dwarf star. But if you have adaptive optics imaging, you see there's a cold brown dwarf that's orbiting it. So it's actually a pair, a red dwarf brown dwarf pair. And that is the record holder for closest passage to our solar system. Jamika. Yes, Chet, thank you. So how does adaptive optics help you um, distinguish the light of a brown dwarf from a much larger star? Okay, this is good because this will come up in a minute. 
or a little bit later. Um, what adaptive optics does is it, okay, let me take a step back. When you look at a star, especially if you're looking at it from the ground, you have to deal with the fact that the atmosphere is blurring out the light of the star. So the star basically they twinkle, which means they, they, they scintillate and they move around. And so it blurs out the image of, uh, of the star. So if you try and take an image, um, you'll just get that starlight just blurring out everything. What adaptive optics does is it fixes the star to a point so it can't move around. And it tries, it keeps that star so still that you can then study um, the area around it that you wouldn't have been able to see before because the atmosphere would have jumbled it up. So when you, when you force all that light into just a small little point, it cleans out this whole area around a bright star to see what's next to it. And so that's the, basically the way we have of determining what lives next to stars. So a lot of what I'm talking about with the census is just knowing where the stars are and what, you know, but if you want to know what's around a specific star, that's when you need adaptive optics. And we have another question from our YouTube live audience. And the question is, did Schultz's star create any effect on our solar system? We don't know. I don't, so it's possible. There's no, uh, it, if it kicked one comet out, right, we wouldn't have any way of testing that because that would have been lost. Um, that information, there'd be no way for us to know when a comet, when like a single comet may have come through, but it's at least possible. It's done, it's, it passed through an area of the Oort cloud where dynamical interactions do happen. So it, it wouldn't, it did not pass close enough to like perturb the orbit of Neptune or anything like that. So, but, but it may have kicked around one or two comments. Thanks for that answer, Trent. Um, I have a question for you. This Schultz's star is just so interesting. Uh, do we have any idea of where it is now? Oh, yes. Uh, that, so that's where, um, that's where we study it now, right? Is it's living, oh, uh, nine parsecs away, I think it's, I can't remember exactly um, <laughs> what, what, what we measured in the paper from, um, from last year. Uh, but, but what was interesting, the reason why this object actually popped out as being uh, interesting to people is when it was discovered is very unusual because it's, because it was only, oh, I said parsec, so let me convert that, about 30 light years away. So not as close as some of the things I was showing earlier, but normally things 30 uh, light years away, you know, you can see their galactic orbit. You, they kind of look like they're moving, you know, like the rest of the stars, um, but it wasn't. And so it was kind of strange. And then someone went and got a measurement of its motion, um, the, the Doppler motion of the star. And they saw that it was moving away from us at like a hundred kilometers a second. So like super fast. And so that was obvious. It was basically a dead giveaway that this thing had like passed right by us. Um, Cause it was, it still is moving at the right today. Still it's main motion is like straight out of uh, straight away from us, which is pretty unusual. Most stars kind of just have random motions. That's really cool. Thanks Trent. <laughs> um, so one of the other biggest surprises that came was this object WISE 0855. And I've circled it in blue because it's cold and I know that I've been talking about how cold things are infrared. Um, but, but, uh, but it's literally like a kind of a frozen planet or a frozen, frozen brown dwarf as I'll show in a second. Um, it was barely, barely detected in the WISE survey. Um, and it's, re, it's one of the closest systems to us. And so that's part of why it's so surprising. Um, this is an artist rendition of it. Uh, from, what, from the amount of light that it's emitting, or I should say the, the amount of light it's not emitting, I guess, it's very, very faint. Um, it must not be very hot. It, it looks like it's probably about negative 20 degrees Celsius or minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So frozen, like ice clouds most likely exist. Um, 
amazingly, the, I was so one of the most amazing things about that that we've done from the ground is take a spectrum of this object in the infrared with Gemini, and that's what's shown over here. And it, you know, there's nothing to <laughs> Uh, unless you're an expert in um, cold atmosphere models uh, and whether they have ice clouds or not, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to see much here. There's another interesting comparison of the spectrum to Jupiter. But the point is, is that it, it agrees. So basically, our under, we do think that this thing is about 250 Kelvin, sorry, and minus 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, and it does all kind of look like it is. Um, and so this thing must be both very low mass and very old. Um, it's literally the only, uh, it's the only star-like object in the sense that it's off there in the galaxy floating on its own uh, that is this cold. Um, and so I just put this here because just as a reminder, like this is literally the only frozen brown dwarf that we know of. Uh, and so one of the big questions I think is, how common are these things? We've only measured one and it's really close to us. So, and it was barely detected. So if it was a little farther away, we wouldn't have been able to see it. Um, uh, so, so uh, and then, okay. So talking about adaptive optics and, and completing the census kind of, if you wanna think about it, is uh, you need to know not just where things are, but how many people live at a given address. Um, and so that's where adaptive optics comes in. Uh, and so these, these are results from the Gemini Planet Imager, GPI. Uh, if you want to know, if you want the full census, you need to go and look around every star and see if there's anything else orbiting it. Um, we, there has been a lot of work to do this, to find interesting planets that near us that we could study. And um, there haven't been nearly as many discoveries as many of us hoped there would be 10 years ago. But we still have a good, you know, we have discovered some things. I think we were dreaming, 10 years ago, we were dreaming of dozens and dozens of, of planetary systems that we would be able to image directly. Um, and so as, as to why we didn't find that, it's, it's kind of still an open question. Uh, is it that planets are fainter than we thought? Uh, are there just fewer of them than we thought? Um, we are still working on that. Um, but some famous one, the, the most, one of the most interesting ones to me is this 51 Eridani B. The reason why is it's the only, it's the faintest of all the directly imaged planets. Um, it's the only one that's consistent with multiple different formation methods for planets. All the rest of these basically have to come from direct collapse of a gas cloud. This one could have been built up through rocky planetesimals combining together and accreting some gas like we think the solar system planets did. Jimmy Kim? Yes, Trent, thank you. Could you tell us a little bit about how exoplanets are named? Sure, so they they just get the name of their star and then a letter after it. So um, th this runs into a little bit of a, well, I don't think it's an issue for any of the stars here. It's not, um, but that's that's all it is. And so th there is a, I should clarify this by saying that a couple of years ago, the IAU, the International Astronomical Union, started the process of a letting some exoplanets be named with proper names. Um, and the last I remember hearing about it, there was some sort of thing where different nations, different countries around the world were allowed to pick a name for one exoplanet. Each country got one exoplanet that they could pick a name for themselves to allow for like, you know, different cultures to be represented in the astronomical names, which I thought was a, kind of a cool idea. Um, but for us, oh, and I should say here, if you see a lowercase b, that means that we think it's a planet. Uh, whereas if you see an uppercase b, that means we think it's a a uh, brown dwarf or a star. Um, did that thank answer? You. Yeah, no, thank you for making that distinction. In fact, about the, the uppercase and lowercase Bs, I hadn't, I hadn't noticed that. Um, we have uh, an additional question from our YouTube audience uh, about the slide you have up. And the question is, um, are those black circles uh, that we see in your slide here, are those black holes? 
No. So the way the um, Gemini Planet Imager works is it uses multiple techniques to suppress. So I mentioned adaptive optics about collecting the starlight into as small of a point as possible to try and clear out the area so you can see stuff around it. Um, that is one piece of GPI. GPI has other um, tricks up its sleeve that it uses to try and further uh, make it easier to see planets. So one of them is a uh, what's called a coronagraph because um, it was originally designed, it's basically a, a, a dark spot that you put at the center of your, your telescope image. Um, it was originally designed to study the corona of the sun, which is the, the thin wispy part that surrounds the sun that you can't see during the daytime. Uh, you can only see it, you can sometimes see it during solar eclipses. Um, so people designed this coronagraph to do that. And so the coronagraph was actually the very first technique used to look for exoplanets ever. Uh, historically, it didn't work because you needed adaptive optics and chronographs. But but people, that's what people did. People was like, okay, well, I use this chronograph around star, uh, just a regular star, not the sun, and block out its light and see if I can see anything around it. Um, Alyssa, do you have something? Thanks for that explanation on chronographs, Trent. Um, I did want to ask, so looking at this image and essentially how we're detecting different exoplanets and brown dwarfs, um, is this implying that most of the brown dwarfs we have found are orbiting a host star or are they just, do they just so happen to be in the background of that star? So these ones are orbiting um, their stars. The, that is a good question though about where do brown dwarfs so where, where do brown dwarfs live? Are they dependents of stars or are they um, independently living at their own address, uh, I guess, is the analogy to continue with the census analogy. And the, let's see, let's put, let's see if, how, how I can say it. So roughly speaking, 1% or so, maybe 2%, somewhere in that range of stars have a brown dwarf orbiting them. So that's not, that's, you know, it's not totally uncommon or unheard of, but it's not very common. Um, whereas the number of brown dwarfs on their own in the galaxy compared to the number of stars on their own in the galaxy is something more like four or 5%, uh, if that makes sense, like a 20 factor of 25 to one or something. so. It's, 25 stars for every brown dwarf or something like that, if that makes sense. I'm just, that's kind of a very rough number, by the way, like that, you depend on which paper you look at. We, we really like, there's some, a lot of uncertainties, like especially the really cold brown dwarfs we know very little about, you know, that could increase that number a little bit, uh, uh, the number of brown dwarfs that is. But we're already at the point of um, uh, saying basically that it is more common by a factor of a few probably to see a brown dwarf on its own versus orbiting a star. There are people, there are still, there's actually some very active research that still kind of thinks that even those star, the brown dwarfs that you see on their own, that they started around a star and got kicked out. So that's one theory. Um, it hasn't, it's not the most favored theory right now, but imagine if you make three brown dwarfs around a star, probably they're only one of them can survive because the biggest one will kick out the other two. It's kind of like Highlander, there can only be one. You can't, dynamically, you can't have too many massive things in one small space. So by that logic, you know, that's the logic of this theory that, that you do end up with more things in the field, but that's a natural consequence of all brown dwarfs forming around stars. But, you know, um, okay, so that answers that question, <laughs> I guess. Thanks, Trent. I do want to remind everyone in our chat um, that we have about five minutes left for our presentation. So put in any and all questions and comments for our speaker um, and we will wrap this up pretty soon. Yeah, I think I just have one slide. Oh, no, two. I was gonna talk about the fact that we also have a census of planets from other methods. Um, in fact, we've even recently in the last few years found 
the very closest star to us, the Proxima Centauri star within the Alpha Centauri system, it has a planet. Um, it's, but these other planets that we're finding these through these other methods um, are much closer to their stars. Uh, when I'm talking about these, like the GPI results, for example, we're talking about outer solar systems. We're talking about things on the scale of Saturn to Neptune or beyond, uh, Pluto, those sort of scales. Um, we also have information about the smaller scales too, and we're finding planets everywhere, right? That's uh, kind of a, one of the big stories in the last 10 years or so. There's just planets everywhere. Um, so the, the last slide I had was just to hit on this idea a little bit more about this, this frozen brown dwarf uh, near us. I mentioned that it's, it was just at the limits of the detection. So what that implies is if you, if you only see one and it was at your detection limits, that usually suggests that there might be more. And the fact that it was found so close to us, does that mean if we went two times farther away, we'd find 10 times more of it, 10 more of these things? I don't know. Um, could it just be the tip of this frozen brown dwarf iceberg? I don't know. And then there's another part of that, which is if we found the coldest thing we've ever found at the limits of our previous survey, does that mean there's even colder things? And maybe those colder things are even more common and that there's an even closer neighbor to us that we don't even know about yet. But there's something even closer, maybe there's something closer than Alpha Centauri that we don't know about. It's possible. We don't have, you know, we would have to go even deeper in the infrared to find find out. So that's it. Okay, I have um, a few comments and questions from our YouTube audience. Uh, comment here, um, prodigious. Thanks and thanks for explaining the naming process. Um, I apologize uh, to our our YouTube visitor here. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce your your uh, name here, but uh, we appreciate your comments and your questions. Um, and we do have um, a novice question as, uh, as our uh, guest describes it. And the novice question is um, not, not directly uh, pertaining to uh, black, um, black dwarfs, but stars in general, which is what causes a star to appear to twinkle? No. Oh. Okay, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, I think it's a combination of the blurring, the mo motion of the star and uh, scintillation, which I'm not gonna be able to explain um, adequately, <laughs> sorry. But basically the, 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 the okay, sorry. I'll, I'll take a brief stab. You're, when you're looking at a star, you're looking through um, a column or a, a bunch of layers of atmosphere between you and space, right? If you're in space, stars wouldn't twinkle because they would just sit there, but the atmosphere is doing things. So you have the different chunks of atmosphere have different temperatures. So that, so the, the light can get warped. It just gets warped as it's coming in basically. Um, Thank okay. you so much for that chat. It looks like we have one last question to end our uh, video here with. Would you like to read that aloud? Yes, Alyssa, thank you. We have a question from Michael Mosby. Uh, Michael Mosby asks, uh, he says, wow, so there could be colder brown dwarfs close to us. Are there plans to increase uh, uh, the infrared, I guess, infrared um, observatories in order to find possibly even colder brown dwarfs? So there is not a, there's no slam dunk mission planned at the moment. Um, the, to the, the best um, hope is actually using a, um, a mission that's designed to look for asteroids. So one thing that the brown, the brown dwarf people and the solar system people have in common is that small asteroids, I guess are, uh, especially the ones near the earth, they're similar temperature to the objects that we're looking for because the, an, asteroid's, an asteroid near the earth is gonna have a similar temperature to the earth basically because it's receiving light from the sun and being warmed by the sun. So. So because of that, we're looking 
at around the same wavelength, we were looking kind of the same wavelength region and we wanna go deeper at those wavelengths. And so there is a mission, but the difference with that upcoming mission that's looking for asteroids is that it wouldn't be all sky. And that's, this is the real, this is why it's so hard to study the solar neighborhood is because you can't just look deeply at one spot on the sky, which is what people who study the ancient universe, you know, the beginning of the universe do. They look kind of in one area and they just go very, very deep. We have to do deep over every single patch of sky. Otherwise you, you know, you can't, the nearest things to you could be anywhere on the sky. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chen, and thank you to everyone in our YouTube Live audience today. If there are any more questions, please feel free to uh, add them in the chat, and I'll be sure that Dr. Dupuy um, gets those questions and will post the answers to those questions in the description box below the video. Alyssa. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Trent Dupuy, and thank you to Jamika for moderating on our YouTube chat. That wraps up our show for today. Please join us again next week for another edition of Live from NORLAB. Bye everyone. Aloha and uhiho.